Welcome everyone to this webinar on climate scenario analysis. My name is James Tilbury. I'm a partner at ERM specialising in climate strategy and I'll be your host for this event. Before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands I'm calling from today and pay my respects to any elders who are present or watching. A little bit of housekeeping. First, we encourage anyone to, who's watching this live as opposed to the recording to put questions in the Q&A channel. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them uh, throughout the presentation and if not, we have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. This webinar is being recorded and we'll put it up on our website and YouTube afterwards and distribute it to those who have requested it. Now, if you're struggling to understand my accent right now, then there, we have also enabled the transcript feature and there's some instructions there on how to get that working and I'm sure Google can also help you out on that front. So today we have a series of um, presentations to bring you up to speed on the latest trends in climate scenario analysis and also the best practice that we've derived from helping companies uh, around the world on this topic. I'm going to start off by giving a very brief overview of some of the moving pieces in this area. I'm then going to hand over to Hannah and James, who are the main stars of this event, as they've just co-authored a report that summarises all those insights from kind of helping hundreds of companies around the world with climate scenario analysis and related work uh, into their latest report. We'll also hear a few words from my colleague in Australia, Ben, who supported a lot of companies locally in climate scenario analysis, TCFD and risk assessments. Before we get into climate scenario analysis, I hope you'll forgive a short commercial break just for those who aren't familiar with who ERM is. We are the world's largest sustainability consultancy. We have 7,500 people globally uh, in 160 offices across 40 countries. We've been around for 50 years uh, and support companies on the full breadth of sustainability services. Now, I won't go into what all those services are, but I will briefly point out uh, that we help companies along the full climate journey. At ERM, we like to say we support companies from boots to bordering, and we do the detailed work, we do the strategy work, and everything in between. When it comes to climate change, that means that we start with climate strategy and integrating that with corporate strategy. We help with target setting along science-based targets and helping understand what the right level of ambition is. We help with the detailed planning that comes after that, the decarbonisation roadmaps and green growth market entry. And we'd also help with implementation. We secure funding, finding assets, doing due, due diligence on deals, and then finally into reporting and disclosures. But that's enough about us, but please reach out or head to erm.com if you'd like to learn more. Oh, and one thing that I just almost forgot is that some of you might be familiar with Point Advisory, which is a uh, boutique sustainability strategy consultancy in Australia that ERM acquired last year and is now fully integrated into the climate change team that I work with. And so you'll hear Ben originally from Point Advisory talk a bit later today. Okay, so if anyone is very familiar with this topic and just wants a summary of the report, then you can tune out for the next five minutes. But I wanted to make sure that anyone new to this topic um, had a bit of a, a firm grounding before we dive into the main event. Because there are a lot of different terms, acronyms, concepts, standards that are constantly emerging in this space. So where this really starts is with both governments and financial institutions who want an understanding of their financial exposure to climate change, for how climate change is going to impact uh, either the economy or their portfolios. And this is particularly related to what we call climate-related financial disclosures. And this raises the question of, well, how should companies uh, with it, whether that's companies that in a certain economy or an investment portfolio should uh, kind of disclose these, these kind of climate related risks. Uh, because ideally, if you're going to aggregate up to the economy level or portfolio level, you want some standardization on comparability uh, between those risks. And the answer is TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. They're essentially the standard for how a company uh, or another organization should report on the risks and opportunities presented by climate change and the different scenarios. I'm commonly asked, well, what are the competing standards? What are the other standards? Well, there aren't really any major ones uh, that we really direct companies to. There are obviously different um, standards for financial risks in general, other standards for climate change. When it comes specifically to climate related financial disclosures, TCFD really is the main standard companies need to worry about. Uh, the sustainability space is very collaborative and, uh, and tends not to duplicate too much uh, the work of others. So for example, ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, has been set up to standardise sustainability reporting at a global level. 
and rather than reinventing the wheel when it comes to kind of, uh, you know, financial disclosures, when it comes to climate change, they've pointed to TCFD and made some clarifying statements that add to TCFD. So governments and investors generally pushing large companies, at least, and other financial institutions to reporting in line with TCFD, either implicitly or explicitly. There's a lot that goes into the TCFD, but one of the main components of work when a company starts to report in line with it is climate scenario analysis. Scenario analysis has been used for many years, well before uh, this became a, a, a focus area for companies. When it comes to climate change, that typically means you're picking, say, between two to four warming scenarios, say 1.5 degrees, two, four degrees, and looking at how those different potential futures impact your business strategy, and particularly how it relates, you know, how it impacts the risks and opportunities that might arise over the next 30 years or so. The TCFD specifically requires that, uh, it feeds into a lot of the, the work, and it's also explicitly uh, requested by ISSB. To clarify that if companies are going to line, report in line with the ISSB, they also require climate scenario analysis. And other bodies such as APRA in Australia uh, also recommend it, if not go so far as, as mandating it at this stage. So this is kind of where a lot of these different concepts and terms point in. So you won't necessarily hear too much about climate scenario analysis being mandatory in and of itself, but there's been a lot of the boot a lot of pressure for companies to report the climate related risks and as a result, uh, most likely kind of conduct climate scenario analysis. So a few, there's been a lot of villains over the years kind of leading us to this destination and setting us on this path, uh, but I'll call out a few of the more important ones for the Australian audience at least. So a number of our kind of peer countries around the world have been moving towards mandatory disclosures in line with TCFD. So in October 2021, the UK announced that TCFD reporting would be mandatory for large businesses. In March this year, the US SEC proposed rule changes around climate-related disclosures, uh, not explicitly against TCFD yet, but in line with that. And then most recently, October this year, New Zealand actually mandated, passed into legislation that TCFD-aligned climate reporting will be mandatory for certain companies. And then closer to home in Australia, in the most recent budget update, the Australian government announced funding to introduce mandatory climate disclosures for large businesses and financial institutions here. Now that funding was announced over a period of four years, but given how fast the present government is moving on climate change, then uh, I would be expecting a four year wait before this becomes mandatory. And there are also some other kind of developments that have kind of been pushing towards this point as well and pushing governments and other bodies to align with TCFD such as CDP, IGC, IGCC and PRI, um, and that's a bit of a mouthful with all those acronyms, and are releasing a plan uh, mid last year for mandatory financial disclosures, essentially leading us to where we are now with the most recent budget update. Okay, that's enough of a, a basic grounding. Hopefully those new to the topic now feel comfortable uh, in this area and have an appreciation for why climate scenario analysis is so important, particularly for large businesses and financial institutions. I'll now introduce our main presenters for this event. I've got uh, Hannah Simon, let's bring out my, my bio notes. So Hannah is a senior consultant at ERM focusing on TCFD uh, scenario analysis and resilience planning and, and other related topics. Uh, she actually has the same degree I do, a Master's of Science in Environmental Change and Management from the University of Oxford. And she's worked in uh, as a climate data scientist and other related roles, at least one of which has required her to fly a drone in the name of science. She's very multi-talented, our Hannah. Uh, James Hubbard, he's a principal consultant at ERM, and he leads a team focused on helping our clients understand their climate-related risks and other sustainability issues. Now, James has been at ERM for almost eight years, which I think is longer than I've done almost anything. And during that time, he supported companies on almost every continent on the planet on a wide range of topics. Uh, he has a Master's of Science in Environment Technology from Imperial College London. So now that I've sufficiently embarrassed my colleagues, I'm going to hand over to them uh, to talk about their recent work. Thanks, James. That was a great introduction. I think <laughs> I've sort of forgotten about the the drone story, but it's good to have that brought to life again. Um, and I guess it's worth saying that your the background <clears throat> that you've provided is actually really great uh, sort of scene setting for what James and I will talk about today. 
you've done a really good job of articulating some of the sort of key drivers for improved scenario analysis. And it's worth saying that you know, the, the work that you sort of the, the background that you were setting now has actually fed into a lot of the thinking that James and I uh, put together. So um, we worked together to put together a piece of uh, thought leadership, which was presented at COP27, and this was effectively a six-step blueprint for how best to respond to the needs that James was talking through uh, earlier. And this blueprint, if you'd like, draws on our experience as climate experts, but also experts in the scenario analysis process. And then we've also grounded that in evidence from the field. So we did some desk-based research and we also spoke to a number of subject matter experts within ERM, but also clients that we'd worked with on the scenario analysis process and clients that we haven't yet worked with. Uh, so these all sort of came together to help us develop this blueprint. But before I dive into what this blueprint is, uh, we wanted to sort of compare the sort of traditional way of doing climate scenario analysis on the screen here is scenario analysis 1.0 versus what we're proposing as an enhanced or improved approach, i.e. scenario analysis 2.0. So just going back to the sort of traditional way of, of the process having been conducted, you know, some of the key limitations we found is that they tend to engage a very core client group uh, with limited ownership. So you know, we typically work with one or perhaps two functions, often that might be the sustainability function or environmental health and safety. Um, and we sometimes found that our outputs uh, and other clients finding their outputs not reaching key decision makers so folks like sitting in the c-suite or or at the board who are making the, the key decisions this of course limits its reach and limits the impact of the scenario analysis outputs um, when it comes to making decisions uh, in driving business strategy in the direction of travel we also found that uh, some of the key findings tend to focus on very long-term climate trends and tends to articulate impacts at a very high level. So this means that the outputs tend to be quite technical, they tend to be quite academic and sometimes resulting in uh, you know, clients or businesses struggling to see the wood for the trees and again you know, struggling to understand how to act on these outputs. And then lastly, uh, outcomes of the process tended to be quite linear. So um, the results of our scenario analysis uh, exercise tended to not really be uh, representative of, of the real world. Uh, the world isn't linear and the way that climate impacts occur uh, aren't linear. And, and so what we then did is I'll, you know, sort of developed an enhanced approach that tries to address some of these key challenges. So if we move over to scenario analysis 2.0, you know, we try to put together an approach that really engages the C-suite and senior management in a way that is interactive and live and very relevant to strategy. The idea here is that this process helps achieve better ownership, helps drive decisions when it comes to acting on climate change. We also try to uh, put together a process that understands the impacts of climate change across business relevant timeframes in a way that is very practical, very implementable, and really takes into account the direction of travel of the business, but also the time horizons that are most relevant to the business. And then lastly, um, this process considers tipping points. So, you know, it understands that the way that climate change impacts uh, the world, but also businesses is not linear. And so we try to take into, why, take into account wider climate trends, like, um, you know, melting Arctic sea ice or and other sort of mu much more macro macro trends again to try and represent uh, the real world here so if we could just move on James to the next slide so we've spoken a lot about the sort of comparison of these two approaches but on the screen here we've got a breakdown or a summary of what the six-step blueprint is and I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'll pass to James uh, in a moment just to, to dive into one of these steps but in short, uh, our process really starts with uh, a convening step. So here we aim to identify a very core group that will really drive the scenario analysis process, but who will also choose a selection of very key decision-making stakeholders to really participate in the process. And a key aspect of, of the six-step approach is to really engage the senior stakeholders who make the decisions in the room. So this first step is really about making sure that we've got the right people in the room here. 
And as part of the step, it's to demonstrate the business case for why scenario analysis is important. We then move on to the second step, which is all about um, defining. So we need to understand a lot uh, sort of how climate related uh, issues might impact the business. And to do that, we need to effectively build a long list of potentially uh, relevant uh, issues. Here we would draw on a diversity of, of sources like industry reports, depending on the specific sector or industry that the business is in, to look at some peers, to look at any work that the business might have done already on identifying climate related issues. And off the back of that, to also define a set of scenarios that might be relevant to the business. And usually these scenarios would represent uh, different futures, so a high carbon scenario, a low carbon scenario, and something in between. This is to align with best practice. But the difference here is that these scenarios are drawn from uh, best practice. So, uh, you know, recognized sources such as the IEA or the IPCC, but they're made specific to this particular organization. And then in three, we effectively build narratives. Uh, in the scenarios that we would have defined in two. Uh, what does this mean? Well, this effectively means enriching the scenarios that we define in step two. So adding nuance as it relates to socio-political and legal trends, uh, trends in policy and market, and of course the physical climate too. And then the idea here is to select time horizons that are relevant to the business. Now, of course, one constraint here is the uh, granularity at which climate data you know, can be generated, but the point here is to marry climate data, which you know, for physical climate, that's typically 2030 and 2050, for example, but we would effectively marry that with a narrative that is relevant to the business and um, sort of inject time horizons that can sit between 2030 and 2050, if you like, uh, again, to align with the typical decision-making cycles of, or investment cycles of a particular business. We then move on to the design phase. So this is effectively, if we remember that the, you know, a big key component of this exercise is to have a sort of live strategy relevant exercise. And step four is really about designing that exercise. This involves identifying a, a facilitator who can lead the exercise. And we appreciate that that needs to be someone who's both well-versed in scenario analysis and sort of climate change, but also can handle a group of uh, very senior stakeholders. So. Firstly, you know, to, to design the exercise, we need to identify a suitable person to run it, uh, but also identify some of the key boundaries in the structure of, of the session, which is ultimately to determine the materiality of the risk and opportunity items that we would have uh, defined in, in step two. And then step five is all about actually having, sort of running the, the exercise. Um, this involves really mapping out the very real world business implications of each of the risks and opportunities that we've identified, really working with the stakeholders in the room to properly articulate what these impacts might be and to use um, you know, best practice uh, practices, if you like, on how to do scenario analysis. So using these uh, relevant sources, but also making sure that we um, integrate some of the very company specific insights into this exercise. Um, and really to be able to articulate here how the company's business strategy has been and will be uh, impacted by the, the key risks and opportunities that might present themselves. Again, this is really in line with the essence of the TCFD and other frameworks, which is to be able to not just understand these risks and opportunities, but also articulate and demonstrate how they impact um, the business strategy and, and operations. And then lastly, we move over to responding, which is really taking the insights from steps one and five and really supporting our clients or organizations to um, link those results back to their strategy to help disclose and then off the back of that to respond. A key aspect of this is defining a time period with which is most relevant to refresh this exercise. And that is you know, ultimately the, the decision of the organization uh, itself. I'll leave it there and pass over to James to take a deep dive into step three. Thank you so much, Hannah, and great to be with you on the on the call here today, everyone. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear I'm um, the second James of two. There are no more Jameses uh, arriving in this call. 
um, but very pleased with you to talk about this topic uh, in some detail. So as Hannah was saying there, we, we're going to take a deeper dive into step three and look at the stage of preparing um, scenarios to use in the analysis itself. And if you just take a look at the screen here, we've got a, uh, a, a an image generated uh, by ERM, but probably um, highly reflective of, of the way that um, scenarios are often constructed by international organizations and, and the various requirements um, that James mentioned earlier in the call. So what we're saying with this image is that uh, there are different scenarios which are um, available for use within analysis such as this. Um, and they have clearly very strongly different characteristics. Um, and the axis that you've got represented in the four uh, boxes on the screen uh, is clearly showing, you know, one axis related to the level of alignment globally. So the extent to which uh, countries and, and regions um, present a, a similar set of characteristics in terms of the level of ambition, for example, um, the level of progress um, on, uh, on, on different climate um, technologies and, and, and policies, for example. And then particularly on the policy axis uh, left to right here, uh, the overall strength of policy, um, whether or not we push towards what you might call high ambition uh, on the left hand side uh, and lower ambition on the right hand side. The key thing to take uh, from, from the slide here is that we are increasingly finding and, and I think also encouraging uh, companies uh, to look to take greater detail from within scenarios when reviewing the impact of them on their business. Uh, as Hannah was setting out over the last couple of slides, uh, there has been a temptation in particular uh, parts of industry to focus on uh, specific data points within scenarios. For example, uh, a specific carbon price or a specific increasing uh, flood depth, for example, at particular locations. But we are seeing now within the regulatory field um, as well as more broadly in the guidance which is provided to, to companies, uh, there is now an ambition to move towards greater insight uh, within the scenarios. So we call this uh, narratives, we call this uh, the information which sits within a, a scenario and effectively builds the, the picture of how the world might emerge uh, under that trend. Uh, and we, we, as I say, are encouraging this, this move towards greater insight uh, particularly for the value which it can uh, provide companies to understand what is happening within the scenario uh, and therefore how impactful uh, it might be to a business. Just taking a couple of examples of that from on the screen, uh, if we take uh, scenario three as an example, uh, in scenario three it points towards a number of changes and trends uh, which might play out uh, over the medium to longer term. Uh, so, for example, pointing towards particular countries and regions where uh, potentially we have um, a, a progress of, of development uh, and maybe potentially growing emissions associated with that. Um, but in some countries, there's a, a pushback against the transition. Um, and that means that, you know, some places uh, it doesn't happen as, as rapidly or, or meaningfully as it could possibly. Uh, and that points then towards uh, a slightly um, uneven transition in different regions of the world. That type of insight uh, from our perspective is really important for companies to review uh, as they consider the trends that a particular scenario points to. Uh, because, for example, you may then need to review uh, how a risk or opportunity is more significantly enhanced in one operating region or country compared to another one uh, where the trend might emerge very differently uh, and ambition is much higher, for example. So this sets out at a high level uh, how we think that uh, further insight to scenarios using narratives and, and picking up on different characteristics of those scenarios can be highly uh, valuable to, to the scenario exercise overall. As we press on to the next slide, uh, we just unpack that a level further here. So you can see we've we've included on the left uh, that image of the uh, the four part um, axis. Uh, and what we're saying is that, you know, one or, you know, potentially more of those scenarios can be unpacked to 
um, a, a greater level of detail. And that's really what's prioritized on this slide uh, on, on the right hand side. So the information provided on that right hand side could in principle be taken from uh, any of the, the four scenarios. Um, it happens in our situation to have come from scenario one. So this is a relatively high ambition um, and high global alignment uh, situation or, or outcome. What we're suggesting is that within the scenarios, you can find um, particular themes uh, to, to, to support the, the narratives which are, are created. And you'll see here that we focused on four different areas, the social, political, legal, policy, tech and market, the finance and, and physical. What we're saying through this is that there is um, great value in, in unpacking the, the detail here um, and looking at the way that some of these trends might play out, particularly over different uh, timeframes and horizons. And you can see here that we've identified timeframes at, at a sort of stopping points out to 2030. And I suppose all of this is done with the intention of trying to make this just that level more, you know, real world. Um, so rather than focusing on a specific percentage or a specific you know, outcome by a particular time frame, we're actually trying to say on the ground what might uh, develop and emerge um, based upon the, the, the political and, and social context, um, as well as the changes which happen in the market and, and well beyond that. And just as importantly, the physical trends which potentially could emerge as a result of, of physical climate change uh, responding to, to emissions in the atmosphere. We won't go through each of the items uh, on the screen here in detail, but just to pull out a couple of, of the types of examples uh, that we are seeing here. So for example, if we take the finance row, um, we are commenting on the extent to which maybe particular banks uh, have net zero commitments. And uh, that points towards potentially in some regions uh, that um, a company might start to see significant finance putting uh, pressure on the nature of their emissions. Of course, uh, over time, uh, that's potentially likely to uh, increase and exacerbate. And by 2026, you're seeing a situation where, you know, all major banks require that um, uh, that there is a level of net zero alignment um, on, on the finance uh, uh, of receiving of, of finance itself. In the physical domain, uh, this is in some senses uh, less clear to to predict due to due to climate trends um, but you've got some examples here by 23 26 and, and 30 um, of particular events which might emerge uh, as a result of of physical climate for example in the bottom left in 23 uh, an example whereby an extreme event might uh, hit a key asset um, and this company which hypothetically is a is a, a port or or similar type of business uh, gets hit by an extreme event and, th and that creating very significant impact as a result. So what you're seeing on the screen here, therefore, is uh, a more detailed, a more granular review of each of the trends and being able to pull through that, that narrative, that insight uh, to a scenario, which really in the context of, of what Hannah was describing as senior engagement uh, with these scenarios, uh, really allows a conversation to develop. So. For example, you can sit in a room with your key stakeholders and really ask questions whereby if we get to 2023 or 2025 and some of these events actually happen, then what is the issue for the business on the ground? Uh, can it manage those issues realistically and reasonably? Uh, or does it really create a problem or a significant opportunity uh, which the company is not prepared or, or ready to handle? And I think that's what this process can strongly bring to life uh, for a company running through this process is that insight to the so what from scenarios uh, and what to understand as the important trends that, that emerge from it. I think one way you can visualize that is similar to what we've put on the screen here. So clearly the overall goal of the scenario analysis exercise is to identify uh, risk and opportunity items uh, and then to give some insight to their overall materiality. And we've done that on the screen here uh, by giving an example of how that could be determined. So on the left hand side uh, we're just showing a relatively simple visualization of how um, you could potentially give a high level quantification 
uh, of the different risk and opportunity items which you are considering. Um, this is a fairly simple, as you can see, uh, almost like a totalizer showing low, moderate or high risk. Um, and that's obviously flowing out of the previous stage. So as we've looked at the different trends within scenarios, uh, we can then start to say, for example, here by 2030, uh, whether or not that scenario appears to present uh, a significant risk to the particular business. That, that allows across a whole dashboard um, for a, a clear picture to emerge um, of the overall significance of, of the scenarios um, and the risk and opportunities to that company. Uh, and therefore, obviously, off the back of this work uh, to prioritize later stages. Uh, and that was what Hannah described in the step six a bit earlier in the in the session. On the right hand side here, then that can emerge into um, a series of strategic uh, decisions um, about the different uh, scenarios, as well as the different uh, assets or parts of the business. Um, and you can see that represented by the, the, the colored circles. So of course, in some situations, um, there are you know, more limited concerns or, or, or caution is, is not really you know, required, right through to where you've got you know, two or three circles showing that potentially under that scenario, uh, the company should consider taking potentially a different strategy uh, or approaching the situation slightly differently. We we really believe that that information suggested on the right hand side of the screen here um, is giving decision useful uh, data and insight uh, to key stakeholders within a business, uh, which allows them then to progress through to actually acting um, on scenarios in a meaningful way um, but just as importantly, with the confidence that they understand what's happening within the scenarios uh, and also are able to, to own them in terms of what they represent for their business. So we really commend this process to you of, of capturing different information about the scenarios and then playing through uh, with those key stakeholders to generate a picture overall like this of the significance uh, and under the different outcomes of the scenarios themselves. And with that, um, Hannah, I'm going to pass back to you. Thanks, James. Yeah, I guess we, what we really just wanted to do was just recap on the process that we've, with the sort of six step blueprint that we have developed. James unpacked and sort of took a deep dive into step three, but we wanted to just flash up on the screen what this process looks like. And if you're interested in hearing more about this, please do get in touch. Our email addresses are at the bottom of the screen, and we'd love to, to talk to talk to you, uh, either, you know, get some of your thoughts about what's you know, sort of around what you sort of, how you perceive this process, uh, but also just have a conversation about um, how we could help you. So that's all from me. James, I'll pass back to you. James T, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Hannah and James too, uh, for, for that and, and for all your fantastic work on this. Uh, and uh, do feel free to reach out to, to James and Hannah if you have more questions on their work. Um, we're kind of offline, but first we have a, a plenty of time for questions and answers. We'll, we'll jump into that, and I might actually ask panelists to turn their videos on, and I'll, I'll stop share, so you can hopefully see us all in, in tile view there. Now, Ben, I was hoping to bring you into the conversation first. You have a lot of experience helping companies in Australia with climate risk, TCFD, climate scenario analysis. So what's resonating most from uh, for you and what do you think would resonate most with your clients in Australia? Thanks, James. Um, in a word, consistency. <clears throat> I might um, digress very quickly. Um, from the core theme of that question to say that um, I guess building on, on, on the clarity that, that Hannah and James have just provided, I believe my role in this webinar is to really to present the perspective of a, a wizened practitioner or a grizzled old consultant, um, if you were. So if it helps, you can imagine me here with a, a, a pipe and sitting in a Chesterfield with some dusty books behind me. Um, That's how I always imagine you, Ben. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad. I'll get there one day. Um, so for, for everybody else on the call, I, I come from the point of advisory acquisition. Um, we've been doing climate risk and TCFD work since before TCFD was a thing. To be honest, I've been doing climate risk assessments from back in back to 2013. 
or thereabouts. Over the years, we have piece by piece developed a framework for scenario analysis. Um, and that's really been built organically as, as the language has evolved and as the guidance has evolved and as the needs of clients have evolved and it's been tested on, on an ongoing basis in each application. And in October, I was really happy to see the release of James and Hannah's report. I was happy to find that what we had developed ground up piece by piece aligns beautifully with what they have developed after stepping back, looking at the research, taking a clear eye perspective on it. And so when, you, when we see ideas converge like this from different, um, different routes, it, it gives me a, a degree of confidence that we are converging on a very useful framework. Um, and so that gets me back to clarity. The language around scenario analysis has varied um, and, and, and changed over the years. Um, it's been mixed up, sliced and diced and, and served up in different ways. Um, the industry needs the clarity that a framework like this provides. Um, but with that clarity, I'd also, I'd say, has it some advice to other practitioners that <clears throat> we need this consistency of approach across different organizations. Um, however, how it's applied at each step of the way, those six steps will vary and needs to vary based on the individual characteristics of the client. Different clients come at this with different levels of maturity, you know, different points in the journey. They can be in different sectors. We can be talking to different levels in the organization structure. Um, they have different decision-making information needs. Um, different organizations view the world differently and interact with the world differently and view risks differently. And so our application of these frameworks need to be sympathetic to those nuances. And so as practitioners, I think we need to be aware of that. Um, and fortunately, the framework that, that James and Hannah have sketched out, I believe provides latitude within each of those steps to allow for that nuance to be, to be worked in. So I believe that was an extremely roundabout way of answering your question, James. Still useful, so thanks for that. Right. We, no uh, we'll dive more into that in a moment, but I want to jump to Hannah. Early on in your presentation, you mentioned uh, executive engagement, you know, kind of engaging beyond the sustainability department, which is typically the part of the organization that does the work, but this work has so many implications for corporate strategy and other departments. So can you talk a little bit about how you make sure that we're engaging executives and other parts of the organization in this exercise? Yeah, sure. And this is actually probably of, of all the interviews that we held, probably the topic that came up the most is how do you actually, you know, these, these are busy people, they have limited time, um, and how do you actually get them in the room in the first place? And what the consistent, I mean, this, it sort of turned into a, into a debate, both internally within the ERM SMEs, but also the, the clients and external stakeholders that we were talking to. And I think the consistent message was, what about demonstrating the business case, demonstrating and articulating the, the importance of their involvement from a business perspective. So, you know, articulating the implications if we don't do this scenario analysis exercise, what does that mean for us uh, as a business uh, from a reputational standpoint uh, and a regulatory standpoint, but also uh, when we think about the actual very tangible financial impacts of climate change. Um, and so effectively articulating the monetary and the financial impact was, uh, like sort of first and foremost, uh, but looking at it from different lenses. So firstly, from a, late, from, from a regulatory standpoint, what is the financial impact on us if we don't do this? But also if we don't have the tools to understand how climate related risks and opportunities manifest themselves out into the future, then we don't have the tools to respond to them. Uh, so what is the likely mon monetary impact if we don't do that? Uh, and of course, it's difficult, it's difficult to articulate accurately that impact without actually doing the scenario analysis exercise in the first place but we felt and we found that the best way to to articulate the impact would be to draw on other you know on peers and the kinds of financial impact that they're facing or you know bring out real real life examples of you know the impact of a flood event that happened in this location um so really at, at the heart of this is just articulating financial impact and demonstrating the business case and from there um you know, hopefully working together and collaboratively with these stakeholders to develop an appreciation for this process, but also um, an appreciation for how to act on its outputs. 
Yeah, so particularly the business case, making it you know, meaningful for other departments beyond sustainability. I think I'd add to that in, in also understanding where the work can feed into that can support the work of, of other areas. And uh, mm. the most obvious example is the uh, chief risk officer, understanding how they understand, how they go about uh, classifying, categorizing and, and dealing with risks so that our outputs feed directly into their work as well and they don't end up being isolated registers of risk, climate and otherwise. James, uh, James, I want to jump to um, your point before around the different kind of warming kind of scenarios. You kind of had 1.5 and 3 as illustrations, but there are many others. We've most recently come from COP27, when where kind of a major question was: Is 1.5 still alive? And some question: Well, if we do get to the point where mm. 1.5 isn't even realistic anymore, then kind of what does that mean, if anything, for climate scenario analysis and the types of scenarios that companies should be focusing on? Mm. Yeah, great question, James. And I think you're you're right. Um, that was a that was a, a hugely live topic at at COP twenty seven, um, and the, the debate really was um, kicked off by a number of articles prior to the the conference asking whether or not, based upon current commitments, we really could realistically achieve one point five degrees. I think uh, that that theme did run the whole way through, um, and I think if you look at commitments, you know, yes, there are. You know, questions about achieving that level of of um, of, of emissions and outcome. Um, I think it's worth saying that the approach that we are suggesting, um, we believe, is is flexible for working across any particular temperature outcome. Um, but I think one thing that's particularly nice about this as a way of working, um, as I mentioned with with one of the particular scenarios, is that it can also capture some of these. Can we call them, you know, non-linear or, uh, or or sorts of slightly more complex uh, transitions that might occur, um, including things like a delayed transition or or another outcome? Um, we sometimes find that just taking a, if you like, a numerical or a, or a data-based answer to that can provide quite limited insight uh, to what actually might be uh, happening over particular time frames, as we mentioned, 2023, 25, 2030, etc. Whereas actually, when you dig a level deeper, as we are suggesting in this uh, in this paper, uh, you are actually able to say, well, in a particular country, in a particular region, there might be a sudden drop off or change or increase in in certain parts of the the scenario and its accompanying narrative. To the point about 1.5 degrees, then uh, James, I think you can quite naturally capture that in a process like this by pointing towards that top left hand corner. You know, high ambition, high outcome. Uh, you can also augment that slightly to look at a scenario by, you know, most of the world heads in that direction or a significant part of the world heads in that direction. Um, but there are potentially very significant regions or, or, or types of countries as a cross section um, where that just does not occur at all. And of course, if some of your operations sit in, you know, country type A and country type B, uh, then you can actually start to unpack uh, that in much greater detail. Um, so I think that's something that we really encourage to uh, to do, particularly by uh, taking quite a realistic view of, of some of the scenarios and, and building ones that really reflect what your business is doing on the ground, uh, whether or not that's in a country with high ambition or a country with lower ambition. Um, and of course, unpacking some of the relevant detail on that related to policy, technology and, and beyond as well. Yeah. That was a great answer, and there was a lot in that. So I'm going to pull out a few key things. Firstly, like scenario analysis is stress testing. So like even if you don't believe a scenario is likely to happen, that the point is not to pick and you know, predict the future. The point is to stress test. So 1.5 will likely still be useful for that purpose, um, mm -hmm. even if we start to lose confidence in our ability to get there globally, uh, at least without overshoot. Uh, you talked about non-linearity and uh, non-linear scenarios such as disorderly transition as we overshoot and then come back down more rapidly and that's kind of the next level of scenario analysis after these linear ones and is in, we're seeing that as increasingly common and increasingly important um, and the third thing which you i heard which is actually saying it quite nuanced is different parts of the world could be on different trajectories and perhaps that's even more so um, over the last couple of years the recent developments and uh, so you might not want to apply the same scenarios different geographies that you're operating in if you want to start to get um, really nuanced about the impact but often that's probably three scenario analysis exercises in we find with companies kind of start simple don't let all this complexity overwhelm you uh, but then move towards 
there's higher levels of detail over time. So the hogging the floor is MC. So I'm going to switch over to Ben now again. And Ben, we have a kind of question for you. How do you harmonize across the variable views from different stakeholders, um, particularly when determining materiality in these exercises? Thanks, James. Yeah, I saw this question come in in the Q&A box a little bit earlier. Um, we have an approach which has worked fairly well over the years. And that, that really is to start out the exercise, the entire scenario analysis approach, um, trying to establish a perspective to allow you to focus on what matters most. Um, so we use what's called um, systems at risk approach, looking at critical functions of business. Um, and a, critical functions are really those functions of um, broader society and economy or the business itself upon which it depends. Without those functions, the business won't work. And so by focusing on those critical functions and how they could be impacted by different climatic hazards, physical or transitional, we can keep the group discussion focused on a common understanding of materiality. And so th those critical functions can differ quite widely depending on the characteristics of the client. If you have a large mining organization, the critical functions can be things like supply routes, um, physical integrity of assets, um, safe working environment, <laughs> things like that, fundamentals, but and of course, um, viable market for the product. <laughs> so and the coke and coal organizations and, and the like have some concerns. They're, they're quite critical, those sorts of functions, for those organizations. But flip side of that, you might have, let's say, software as a service providers and their critical functions could be things like um, cheap energy for data centers or even um, availability of, of low carbon aviation if they happen to fly a lot. Um, so these things can, can differ broadly, but we look to establish them early for the organization at hand to keep this conversation corralled. So hopefully that answers the question. It does. And I think it gets to one of the fundamental tenets of how you do valuable scenario analysis, kind of to Hannah and James's point around connecting this to corporate strategy. You can just do this as a surface level sustainability reporting exercise where you go through the motions, you put a report out there. But if you want to generate real value for the organization, then you do need to start with those fundamental questions of how does the organization generate value uh, fundamentally and how do those kind of uh, the capitals that business draw upon kind of get impacted under different scenarios in different geographies. Uh, Hannah, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I think Ben, you did a good job of, um, yeah, of, of summarizing it. I think the, the key thing, again, that goes to one of the points that I was making earlier was around facilitation. And it is, it will be a challenge to, to harmonize the views of very many and, you know, diverse voices. But I think to have someone who can, uh, both manage those voices so you know once we've done the pre-work and sort of understood and uh, justified why we've got this sort of long list of issues and why a certain materiality determination should be made I think to be able to have someone in the room who can who can read between the lines of the of the voices in the room and manage those varying uh, voices I think would be super helpful I might echo that back to back to you Hannah um just to elaborate a little bit of, of my past experience. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the, what people think matters most varies depending on their perspective. If you ask an operations manager what matters, what matters most, they might go straight to physical hazards. If you ask someone in procurement what matters most, they might go to supply chain. Someone in finance might go to access to debt. Um, and so having that facilitator in the room very much matters. Um, so I'd like to echo that. Anything you disagree with? Oh, yeah, we can take that offline. That's fine. So I might start. I'm trying, I'm trying to find something I disagree with, but I can't. This is the problem. <laughs> the, 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 the frameworks align too well. Oh, we'll keep digging. But we do need to draw us to a close. But a few closing comments. Um, kind of James and Hannah, like, what's next? Now that you've written this report, I'm sure it's a huge amount of work and you have a well-deserved kind of end of year break coming up, uh, but what's next for next year on scenario analysis on your place? Happy to offer some thoughts on that, uh, James. I think I think from, from my perspective, if you look at what's really emerging with scenario analysis, it, it's got 
two or three very clear characteristics to it. The first one really is very fast emerging regulatory environment. And, and you mentioned that in, in, in Australia. Um, I, I can see it from, from my work being based in, in Europe, but it's, it's, it's fundamentally global by, by character. Um, and you can see that from the TCFD's latest status report um, in October, uh, where they are just really starting to profile this extremely wide range of countries, whether it's Japan, Singapore, New Zealand, uh, the EU, the US, and, and much further afield um, in terms of, of regulatory change. So, uh, you know, the, the starting point, the scenario analysis has to be this uh, completely unavoidable kind of context of, of, of regulatory change. Um, I think the second it is, is, uh, is, is being driven from the investor space. I think we had two or three years of, of regulators, of investors, sorry, really starting to push uh, the agenda within um, annual meetings and, and beyond to ask for greater disclosure. Um, I, I, think, I think that era is still ongoing, but I think what we're seeing on the ground actually is an increasing push towards uh, the, the, the ask for, for detail within scenarios. And sometimes that happens overtly, you know, in those big kind of um, big pitch uh, meetings. Um, sometimes it's it's very much behind the scenes, uh, you know, banks and credit providers talking uh, to to their recipients, um, investors having you know small group meetings and others with 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 their investment entities to really discuss uh, how this could be impactful to their business. Um, and I think in 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 so many cases, you know, kind of not taking no for an answer really, um, and really needing to be told, have you drilled into this? Have you prepared? All different parts of the business um, and I think you know Ben is is spot on in saying that this obviously covers all the different functions and plenty of those stakeholders will not rest unless you can show that you discussed it with your risk lead uh, with your head of supply uh, and the various other functions this needs to cover so I think we very strongly see that 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 pace and extent and detail of questions is completely inexorable um, and, and doesn't show any signs of stopping in the near term and, and certainly there's a, there's a surge in those when new regulations emerge uh, and particularly when major climate events, you know, very unfortunately happen as well. This seems to kind of peak interest. So my, my prediction, if you like, for 2023 is that acceleration will continue, uh, but we've got our eyes on particular markets, particular types of investors uh, where this seems to be accelerating particularly quickly. Yeah, some very good points. Um, Hannah, any uh, final thoughts from you on what happens next or key takeaways? Yeah, so I think James has done a good job of articulating the sort of wider landscape. But I think what's next for us as a team is to continue testing this approach. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've developed a six-step approach which responds to the, the need that James has just articulated. And now what, what's next for us is to keep testing that with, uh, in, in, you know, internally and sort of making sure that it's as robust as it could possibly be. Um, and you can look out uh, by next cup to have you know a, a more uh, detailed approach as to how to how we'd actually go uh, go on implementing this process. I don't know, if James, if you want to add any more uh, any more insights from your from your side, particularly on the work that we're going to be doing to respond to this need. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, I think I think that's that's exactly right from our perspective, Hannah. And I think you know we're we're looking for uh, plenty of engagement, um, as we said uh, on the slide. So. Uh, if you have any thoughts or reflections uh, on how we have framed this, then please do reach out to us and, and discuss. Uh, we really see ourselves being in a period of, uh, of, of discussion and, and engagement on this topic of enhanced scenario analysis. Um, so we really welcome views and, and thoughts on, on whether this process would work for you. Yeah, absolutely. Ben, would you like to have the final word before I wrap up? I do like to have the final word. Um, but for this, I'll, I'll keep my, um, my practitioner's hat on um, and say that what we've worked through today, um, it, it's a lot of content and, and getting end to end on a, on a full scenario analysis, bringing an organization into maturity with that, with this approach um, can take years, but that's okay. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I don't think getting to your point from, um, from before James, um, People shouldn't be daunted by this. Uh, it's entirely um, feasible and indeed it's, it's, it's recommended that we start gradually 
um, keeping the overall framework in mind, you can take gradual steps towards that being a mature implementation. You can um, apply it at a high level initially, or you can take it stepwise, whatever works for your organization, but you need not do it all in one go and bite off the whole thing at once. Um, it can be done gradually. So uh, don't be alarmed by the apparent volume of work. Yeah, that's a great point to close on. Well, thank you very much, Ben, Hannah, and James. I'll, I'll let you exit the, the virtual stage. And thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, well, please reach out if you have any questions about climate scenario analysis or any other sustainability topic, really. We, we truly do support companies across the broad spectrum, sustainability and social issues as it relates to business. Uh, so don't be a stranger, and I'll now leave you with uh, our contact details on the screen.